Let's open our Bibles to the book of Psalms. Uh, Psalm 145 is where we'll read today. Just have one verse. Psalm 145, it's right near the middle of your Bible. There's a page number that's marked if you're using a pew Bible. There's a page number marked in your program today. And uh, if you're using an electronic Bible and you're not spending uh, most of your time on Facebook while that's open, then uh, you, can, uh, you can look it up in any number of ways. Uh, complete these common American phrases for me. If it sounds too good to be true, probably is. We make money the old-fashioned way. We yeah, hope to inherit it from a wealthy, unknown uh, ancestor. Yeah. Uh, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Yeah. No pain, no... God helps those who, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's one of those that when you say, okay, what's, the, what's your favorite verse in the Bible, quote a verse in the Bible, uh, folks quote that, and you know, it's nowhere in the Bible. In fact, it's, it's contrary to Scripture. Everything about our way of life here seems to teach that you, you get what you earn in life, no free lunch, and in America especially, we're very aware of the values of competition, of, of working hard. Uh, applying some elbow grease, all those phrases that we use. And it has created a country that is prosperous and wealthy and uh, enjoys much. We tell people, you get what you deserve in life. And if you want to make something of your life, it is, it, it's up to you. And that's that American work ethic. Now, here's the, here's the only problem when, when we think about that American work ethic and we bring it into, into the church. The problem is God doesn't operate on an American work ethic. In fact, God is not an American. I, I, don't, I don't know if, if you have ever considered this before. Uh, we, we, we like to baptize him into America, but God is not an American. God is God on his throne, mighty to deliver, mighty to save. It, it, it makes it difficult for us sometimes when we when we try to bring that American work ethic and that philosophy, which has a lot of benefits to it, absolutely, and we try to take it into our spiritual world, in this work-driven mentality, we end up with some problems. And I want to read a verse to you. This is Psalm 145, verse 8. And it says, The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. That is... That phrase, and depending on your translation, the words will change slightly. It's always pretty close. That occurs in at least five different books of the Bible. It occurs multiple times in the book of Psalms. It was a mantra that the people would say over and over and over again. If, if you were going to memorize a verse in Old Testament times, this one was something that was going to be at the top of your list. Everybody was going to know this verse. And it says that God, rather than us uh, calling us to be in this work ethic mode, in our spiritual life, it says God is gracious. Uh, some translations say uh, compassionate, slow to anger, rich in love. Maybe in that verse you circle the word gracious because that's where uh, we're going to spend our time today. The Bible says God is a gracious God. And it means, some, we do this in theology, we say God is a gracious God out there. But you have to make this personal. God is gracious to you. This comes really close. It's going to get right into your business, right into your heart. He is gracious to you. And He loves to bless people who don't deserve it at all. That's the nature of our God. And I'm glad God blesses people who don't deserve it at all because I'm one of those people. You can't understand the Christian life unless you understand grace because it is at the heart of biblical Christianity. It's the heart of our relationship to God. And when you understand grace you're going to feel closer to God. And when you understand grace, you're going to feel a whole lot more loved by God. And when you understand grace, the, the more you're going to reach out to know God and serve God and be grateful to God. And it is by this system of grace that God draws us to Himself, brings us to Himself. One definition of grace, and I have several here, grace is God's love in action. Another God giving me what I need, not what I deserve. One of my very favorite definitions of grace, grace 
is the face God wears when he looks at my failures. When, when he looks at me and all my fallenness, all my brokenness, all my waywardness, grace is the face he wears when he looks at me. You need to understand the difference between grace and mercy. Both words appear in verse 8. Uh, mercy is when do, God doesn't give you what you, what you do deserve. Uh, what we deserve, every one of us, no matter how good we are, how religious we think we are, every one of us deserves death and hell. Everybody in the building, uh, and, and especially the people who aren't in the building today, they really deserve it. Everybody deserves death and hell. That is our default destination, default uh, punishment due to us. But God is merciful and he doesn't give us what we deserve. Grace says God gives us, uh, give, not only does he give us what we deserve, mercy, he gives us grace, he gives us what we don't deserve. He rewards us, he blesses us with things we in no way merit. Now I know many of you, when we talk about grace, you say, oh I understand grace, I'm familiar with the word grace, I've, under, I've heard about grace for a long time, we know we're saved by grace, but what I've discovered among many Christ followers is they know they're saved by grace, but, but we don't act like it. We spend our, our whole life thinking and acting like we're saved by works. And, and for many of you, even though you know you're saved by grace, that you don't get into heaven by being a good person or a religious person, still your entire life ends up being built around, I, I, I have to impress God like he's an unpleasable parent. That... You, you go through life and uh, God is just following you around with a clipboard just waiting for you to mess up. He goes, ha, caught you again, loser. That, that's just not how God operates. That we are saved by grace. We stay saved by grace. We live by grace. It really is all about grace. Now, today, what I'd like to do is look at uh, five aspects of saving grace. We could spend months just talking about grace and all the different ways grace is applied, all the different things God says about grace and His Word, but we're going to talk about committing your life to Christ kind of grace. How do you know for sure you're going to heaven when you die? How do you know your sin's forgiven? How do you know you're walking through life in a relationship to God? That part of grace. And I built this, uh, if you've seen your outline today, I built this around an acrostic. I don't do too many acrostics, but I got an acrostic, G-R-A-C-E, grace. And because I don't do this very often, it stands out in my head when I do, and it reminded me of a story, because sometimes that, that's what happens to me. So, Grace, and it's a story about a professor who was to speak uh, to the student body at Yale University, and he, wanted, he decided, I'm going to talk to these students at Yale University about uh, what it means to be a Yale student, to really... To, to live the life. What, what is the characteristic of a student at Yale? And, and so he used the acrostic, Y-A-L-E. And he said, a student that, and this was his outline, they're, they're young, they're adventurous, they're loyal, they're enthusiastic. And so he pursued his outline and gave his speech at Yale. And, but in that four-point outline, he, he talked for over an hour and a half about those four things. And it, it got kind of wearisome for the student body listening to this speech go on and on and on. And at the end of it, he finished, concluded. Everyone was most grateful. He turned around and there was uh, there were some folks on the platform, including uh, someone who's in student leadership. And he turned to that student and said, so what did you think about my acrostic uh, speech, uh, Yale? The student said, I just couldn't help but thank God that I wasn't at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. <laughs> so, I promise you, uh, I, I, I preached at least once a day and shared the gospel dozens of times a day, every day in Tanzania. So I don't have a lot of pent-up preaching left in me, uh, so we will not go that long today. Here we go. Letter G. And when you think about, when you think about grace... Think about it this way. It is God's gift to me. Paul the Apostle wrote, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. It's a free gift. Now, because of this American work ethic I was talking about 
A lot of people think that you're going to be saved by, by what you do, by earning your way to heaven, by being good enough. And God says, no, just arm, my arms open wide. Just, just come on to me. If, uh, if you went to any place where people gather in Collin County and you ask the question, so how do you go to heaven? How are you saved? How do you, how do you receive eternal life? You ask 100 people, 99 of them will say something to the effect of, well, yeah, you try to be a good person. You try to live a good life. I, I do religious things. I'm trying to make sure that my pile of good stuff is heavier than my pile of bad stuff, that the scales are weighed at least the moment I die, I want to be 51% of the good. And then uh, I, think, I think I'm pretty sure, I sort of believe that I've done enough. I'm a nice person. I'm better than most of the people I know. I'm going to go to heaven. It's all based on works. Now, the interesting thing for me is also, so I'm walking dusty trails in Tanzania and asking the same question. And you know what they tell me? Well, I'm a pretty good person. I'm a religious person. I do good things. The exact same thing. This is true in every culture worldwide. The natural bent of our hearts is always toward salvation by the stuff we do. Our sin is going to be forgiven by what we do and who we are and the spiritual resume we try to construct for ourselves. And you need to understand... That God says, salvation is absolutely free. You don't work for a gift. It's a free gift. God says, salvation is absolutely free. You can't earn it. You can't buy it. You don't deserve it. You can't work for it. And this is, this is the fundamental difference between how biblical Christianity, and again, I am using that phrase over and over again because there are so many expressions of Christianity in our own land that are so far from God and, so, and, have, and have so turned from Scripture that we have to say biblical Christianity to define what it means to be a Christ follower in our own country because it does not mean the same every time someone says, I'm a Christian. So the difference between biblical Christianity and every other expression of Christianity between every other world religion, every other faith and belief system, Christianity is the only religion built on grace that says God, God just gives you this salvation. He offers it up to you, not because you've earned it, not because you deserve it. Every other religion is based on works, and, and, and you can summarize it in one word. It's based on works, and it's all about D-O, do. What do you do? Well, you, you live a good life. You go through this checklist of religious things. You, uh, you do nice things for other people. You give money to good causes. You, you do all these things. It's all about what you do. Each system is different, but you do certain things to gain forgiveness and bliss or heaven, whatever they're going to call it, God's approval, but it's always something you do. Rules, regulations, rituals. On the other hand, if you're going to summarize biblical Christianity in one word, that word is done, D-O-N-E. It's just all done. It's all paid for. It's already been done for you at the cross. When we sang Jesus paid it all, Jesus paid for all the sin that you have done and will do at the cross. He paid for your salvation, paid for your sin. It's already done. Jesus already did it. He paid for your salvation at the cross, and now it's a free gift to you. And that's why. That's why Jesus Christ, when he's hanging on the cross, and every time I shared the gospel in Tanzania, we got to this spot where you know, the last thing Jesus said before he died on the cross, he said, it is finished, to telestai. It's an accounting term that means all paid up. The debt's been paid. Everything that was due has been settled, paid at the cross. Now, Jesus did not say, I am finished. He said, it is finished. Jesus was way far from finished. He's alive today, the resurrected Christ, victorious over sin, death, and hell. He is very much alive. He, he wasn't finished. It was finished. And what is it? Your salvation. The plan to provide grace for every person who needs it, and every one of us needs it. It's all finished, all paid up. And God said, here it is. It's just a free gift for you. I, I want to give it to you. I want you to receive this, accept it, and I want it to change your life. I, I'm not getting into heaven based on what I do or what I've done or some spiritual resume. I'm getting into heaven only one way, and this is the only way anybody gets into heaven, based on what Jesus did for me at the cross. You're never going to get a better deal than this. I'm you're never going to get a better deal than this. It, it, is, it is readily available, easily accessible, and it's the only plan that works. This priceless gift of eternal life, God's gift to you. 
Now, here's the second thing. R. You're saved by grace. You, you receive this by faith. The Bible says, and I, I shared this verse earlier, for by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It's a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Faith is the key that unlocks the door of heaven. How about that? It's just a gift, and you receive it. You receive it by faith. Now, some big program descended upon southern Tanzania, and some big somebody figured out coffee grows in southern Tanzania, and it was everywhere. Everywhere we went, we run into coffee plants. So it's become a big cash crop. It worked against me in some of the places I was because there's money. And where there's money, people become a little more self-sufficient. And they may not have electricity or running water and all their toilets are outdoor uh, outhouses. But they got enough money. They don't think they need God anymore because there's food to eat. Um, so they're growing, they're growing coffee. Everywhere I went, I saw coffee plants. This Tanzania coffee. In this lovely decorative bag. And I brought it today because I want to give it to somebody. But here's what you got to do. You got to come get it because I'm not going to bring it to you. It's a gift. It's free. You just got to come. You just got to come take it. (laughs) Mm. Mr. Hardwick, enjoy. I do not guarantee the bug-free nature of that coffee. Okay, yeah, you know, Doug didn't have to, I knew there'd be a brave soul, Uh, he didn't have to do anything to earn that, to deserve that, he's a great guy, he just had to come and he had to to take that, Uh, by faith, believing I wasn't going to take it away from him, or run the other direction when he came up, uh, but I was going to give it to him, now, What the Bible says, for by grace you've been saved through faith. He says salvation is a gift. And and, and you can't brag about it. Not not a result of works that no one could boast. You imagine what heaven would be like if it was all based on what we do? We'd get to heaven and everybody would be saying, well, let me tell you what I did to get here. Let me tell you about what a great person I am. Let me tell you how I probably am going to have better seats in heaven than you're going to have because I'm so much better than you are because I did this, 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 this. It would just be this big brag fest in heaven. God says to us, it's a, it's a grace gift, your salvation. I, I just give you forgiveness free. Heaven for free. And you don't brag about it because you didn't earn it. You don't deserve it. It's a gift of God. All you can do is be grateful for it and thank God for He is a gracious, loving God. Salvation isn't based on my performance. It's based on the promise of God. It's not based on uh, my goodness. It's based on the grace of God. And, And that's why He gets all the credit for it and He gets all the glory and there's nothing that I do to earn it or deserve it. It's free gift by faith. Do you remember the story uh, of the prodigal son? It's a great example of, of grace. That there's a father, he has two sons, and one of the sons, the younger son, he's a kind of independent spirit, wants to do his own thing, and he's before dad's off the scene, he wants half the inheritance. He wants his share while dad's still living. And the dad amazingly carves up the estate and gives him the half, and the youngest son, he's off to the races. And it's wine, women, and song. And he blows through that money. And he has lots of friends at first. But then as the money disappears, so do the friends. And before long, he's, a, he's just hit rock bottom. He, he's in a Jewish culture. And the only job he can find is he's feeding pigs. And it doesn't get any more uh, repulsive to a Jewish man than, than even being around pigs. But feeding pigs. And then he gets to a spot where he realizes... I think the pigs are eating better than I am, and what they're eating is starting to look good to me. He's hit rock bottom. He has nowhere to look but up. And, and he starts thinking about his dad, and he says, my, my dad's servants are doing better than I'm doing. They're, their lives are so much better. He treats them much better than I'm being treated right now. And he developed his plan. He's going to go back to dad and say, Dad, I, 
I've, I've messed up so much. I, I've, I've disappointed you so badly. I've, I've wasted all these resources. And if you just take me in as a servant in your household, I no longer deserve to be called your son, but if you take me as a servant, I would, I'd be so grateful just to be here. And the Bible says he has that speech all rehearsed in his head. So he's going to rattle that off as soon as he gets to dad with a whole lot of humility. And the Bible says, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and he ran to him. A, a, a significant man like this guy who has property and he has servants. and he, he's, a, he's a well-to-do guy. One of the things about being a man in that culture is that man does not run. He is steady and controlled and authoritative, but it says he runs to his son and embraces the prodigal son. He doesn't wait until he gets this pig smell off of him. He doesn't wait until he's spilled all of his apologies and repentance. He just grabs him and he says, my son who was gone has come home. And, and he says, bring our best robe, bring the family uh, ring, uh, let, kill the fatted calf. We're going to have a party because my son who was lost has been found. And that's grace. The son, did he deserve it? No, he'd blown it in every imaginable way. But he was willing to turn to the father. And the father welcomed him with arms of grace and love. And the son, he just received all that by faith. Now, the next thing, this grace, it's, it's available to everyone. God doesn't play favorites. I mean, regardless of your background, regardless of your status, regardless of, of your, your sin, it doesn't matter how religious you, you think you have been, how uh, non-religious, uh, if you don't have any religious background at all. So the promise is received by faith, is Romans 14. It's given as a free gift. And we are all certain to receive it, whether or not we live according to the law of Moses. If we have faith like Abraham's, for Abraham is the father of all who believe. God says it's available to anybody who just open up their heart in faith. That's how accessible it is. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It's not just really good people will be saved. Really religious people will be saved. Really smart people will be saved. Wealthy people will be saved. It says anybody, anybody who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. And, and the sad thing is, there's so many people who they know this. They've heard this. This unconditional gift to us. And they say, uh, no, I'm going to stay on the self-improvement plan. I'm going to keep working on this. One of my longest visits that I had while we were in Tanzania was with a man that... Uh, he, he, and, and at this point, we had we'd done a lot of training with the people who were with me. There were like five of us moving together, house to house, village to village. And... Uh, and I shared the gospel and I said, would you give your life to Jesus Christ? He said, no, I'm, I'm okay. Not now. I and mean, we were talking about heaven and hell. Heaven or hell. The only way to choose heaven, give your life to Jesus. You don't, give your, you don't choose Jesus, you've chosen hell. It's very clear in the scriptures. He said, well, I'm okay. I don't need to do that now. Uh, I, told him, I told him a story, gave him an example. Someone his exact same age that I knew here who had just recently died, a friend of my son's. And I said, he's the same age as you. He thought he had all the time in the world. And all of a sudden, he has a headache. And two days later, he's dead. He had a brain tumor. I pulled out the stops. I, I, was, I was going for broke on this guy. I just had such a burden for him. And then I stepped back. I just pointed to the pastor from uh, Kenya. And, and he came in. He's a real animated character, kind of a Christian Chris Farley kind of dude I was partnering up with. And he just went to town, and he's animated and talking and preaching and swinging his arms around. And he, no response. So I looked at my Tanzanian pastor friend. Go get him, boy. And he tore into that guy. Then uh, one of our ladies in our group from the church uh, she spoke, and in the end, uh, that guy just walked away. 
uh, he didn't he didn't need it. He was going to get there in a different plan on his own. Listen, if you think you're going to get to heaven on your own merits, you can forget that. Heaven is a perfect place and, 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 and you are not. None of us are, are perfect and by a long shot. The only way you're ever going to get in is by receiving this gift. Receiving it by faith, which is available to every person. Every person, uh, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It is, it is for the world. Here's the fourth thing. It comes through Christ. It comes through Christ. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Why through Jesus Christ? Why is Jesus the only way? Why not, why not Buddha? Why not somebody else? Because Jesus is the one that paid the price of admission. Because he's already paid for your salvation. No one else is doing this. No one else can do this. No one else is the sinless son of God. So on the cross, he's paying for our sin. He pays our sin debt for us. Grace is free. But never, never, never start thinking grace is, is cheap. Because this cost Jesus' life. Don't, I talk about this being a free gift, but don't be flippant about this and say, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, sure, I'll pray and give my life to Jesus, and then I'm going to go on doing my own thing. Don't, don't minimize, don't uh, trivialize the cross of Christ and what he did for you at the cross. Jesus paid for your ticket to heaven. The, the law tells you where you blew it, where you did wrong, where you sinned, but grace says, Here's the only way to get it fixed. Here's the only way to make this right. Here's the only way to have your sin forgiven. Here's the only way to get your life moving in the right direction. All that comes by grace. The grace of God and the free gift by the grace of the one, that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded, Paul says, for many. In the Bible, my favorite description of someone who, uh, who is a become a believer, who gives their life to Christ, my favorite description is in Christ. It happens, that, that little phrase occurs about 100, and, just over 120 times in the New Testament. That someone who becomes a Christian, they are in Christ. And that, that's such a, a vivid image for me. I'll explain it to you this way. So let's say this card represents my life. And it represents all the sin in me. And it is, it is visible to God. And it's pretty visible to most everybody else who knows me at any level. And... We'll say my, my Bible represents, represents Christ. And here's me. And, and this reminds me of all the things I've done to disqualify myself from ever spending eternity in heaven, ever being perfect by far. But the Bible says Christ, Christ takes my life with all my scars, with all my failings, all my faults, and he pays for it at the cross. He offers this up to me. And to be in Christ, what happens is that God takes my messed up life and by grace through faith in what he did for me at the cross it's in Christ and settled and you don't see that part of me anymore all you see is is the Christ part of that illustration and one day one day I'm going to stand before God and give an account for my life and when, when God looks at me he doesn't see all that sin and brokenness and all that because of Christ because I'm in Christ all he sees is Jesus and what Jesus did and the holiness and the perfection and the righteousness of Christ and I am hidden in him God puts me in Christ the Bible says I do not nullify the grace of God for if righteousness were through the law then Christ died for no purpose if, if I could be saved, if I could get to heaven on my own merits, and a whole lot of people are on that self-improvement plan, they're climbing a ladder and they think they're going to get there by their own efforts. If that was true, then the, the cross is a waste. Do you, do you get that part? If there was another way than the cross, God wouldn't have gone to that extreme measure in order to pay for sin. The, the reason Jesus died on a cross is because that was the only way. You're going to get there. There's no other way. You either get into heaven with Christ, in Christ, or you're not going. It's a free gift, and you accept it by faith. Grace is all about what God does for me because of what Jesus did for me on the cross. Uh, another acrostic for grace I, I came across. 
God's riches at Christ's expense. That's grace. It comes through Christ. It's only through Christ. There's no other way. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus said, no one comes to the Father but by me. There is only one way to have your sin forgiven, to know you're, going, you're in a relationship to God now and know you're going to heaven one of these days. It's through Jesus Christ. And then, fifth, and this is a great part, extended through eternity. That this, this plan of grace, it's extended through all eternity. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. In Christ Jesus our Lord. The results of God's grace are going on and on forever and ever. And eternal life is one of the great benefits of grace. Eternal life. The best is yet to come. Is the world a mess today? Absolutely it is. I don't expect it would be different than that. This is not heaven. Heaven is the place where there are no problems. Where everything works the way God wants it to work. The Bible says that this is a free gift of God. Eternal life in heaven. You ever thought about what heaven's going to be like? I, I find myself more and more thinking about heaven. And thinking about what the Bible says about heaven. It's a place of reunion. We're reunited with friends, family who are in Christ. Who belong to Him. It's a place of reunion with believers forever and ever. I say goodbye to people in Tanzania and both churches I was in. I told them both. I may see you again here in this world. We may cross paths again partner in ministry somewhere, but I know that one of these days through Jesus Christ, we'll be together forever and ever in heaven. And if not here, I will see you there. That's the nature of, of eternity. It's a reunion place. Not because someone's a really good person. Not because grandma cooked good biscuits or dad loved to fish. Are they going to be in heaven forever? There's only one way, and it's through Jesus Christ. And we cannot dumb that down to say, good people go to heaven. Because there is none good. No, not one. We all deserve death and hell. And there's only one way we're going to overcome that. And it's by putting all of our faith in the gracious gift of the one overcomer of death, Jesus Christ. Heaven's going to be a place of reunion. It's going to be a place of reward. Uh, we, don't, we don't do the things we do to, to earn God's favor, earn God's salvation, earn God's forgiveness. The things that we do, we do because we love Him, because we're thankful to Him, because we live the Christ life in this life. And so there's a reward waiting, and I'm storing up treasures in, in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. There, there are rewards coming in heaven, and what we do in heaven is largely determined by what we have done here. And we spend way too much time investing in a temporary place here and not nearly enough time investing in eternal things there. It's going to be a place where we're reassigned to do new work based on what we like to do, how God's gifted us, new assignments we'd love to do. I love to talk about this. Heaven is, is not just sitting and singing songs forever. And thank goodness, uh, I'm, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure I'll be a singer in heaven either. I'm not one here. But you know, the, in heaven... Uh, we're not also, we're not sitting on a cloud strumming a harp looking bored all the time. Heaven is a place of incredible activity, incredible advancement. We, we reign and we rule with Him. Heaven is a place of great responsibility and excitement. And we are assigned to the place that is our sweet spot of service when we get to heaven. And then it's going to be a place of release. I love this part about heaven. And the more I walk with people in this world, the more I feel this part of it where we're free. We're free from pain from suffering, from sickness, from sadness, sorrow, grief, depression, loneliness. None of those things are going to be in heaven. It's going to be a wonderful place. And it's the gift of God. And here's, just, here's the one catch. This gift from God, you, you have to accept it. You can't just know about it. You can't just think about it. You have, to, you have to buy in. You have to accept it. You have to believe it. You have to trust it. You put all your faith in this and this alone. And that's the only way anybody goes to heaven. Many of you have heard of uh, Peter Drucker. Early on in my ministry, I started reading books by Peter Drucker because I found out I had a lot of training in Bible and theology and not a whole lot in business management. A lot of things about church life or about administration. So Peter Drucker was really helpful to me. Father of American management. A lot of his dozens and dozens of books, a lot of them are textbooks in university settings. A pastor asked him one day, how did you become a Christian? 
As Peter Drucker has a great Christian testimony. He said, how did you become a Christian? And his response was, when somebody first explained grace to me, I realized I was never going to get a better deal. You're never going to get a better deal than what we talked about today. Open your life to the grace of God through Jesus Christ. It is your only hope, and it is free. The Bible says, therefore, God longs to be gracious to you. He, it is the inclination of the heart of God to be gracious to you, and He extends this to you. He enjoys being gracious. He's not mad at you. He's not this vengeful deity far off in the sky. His heart is broken for you. And, and he wants you to come home to him. To say yes to Jesus Christ. To, to, to make that faith commitment in response to the grace of God is very simple. And uh, I, it's, it's your heart and God's heart. But maybe I can give you some language to work with to say it in a way that uh, helps to express your heart to God, to say yes to God. There's certain things that are key in the scriptures about making that kind of commitment. And uh, I, I want to lead you in that kind of commitment prayer. I'm going to pray this out loud. Uh, we do this from time to time. Maybe you'd pray it silently after me, and you'd say, yeah, today. God's offering all this, and, and I want to receive it. This prayer is, is a way for you to say to say yes to God today. So as I pray this out loud, if today you just want to settle this, you want to know for sure, you, you want to put away doubts, you, you realize I've been doing the I believe in Jesus, oh, and my good stuff. When you add something to Jesus, you're not talking about the Jesus in the Bible anymore. It's all by grace or it's not at all. So let me lead you in this prayer. So let's bow our heads and maybe, maybe this helps you give you some language. Talk to God. Maybe you'd say, dear God, thank you that you love me. I confess that I am a sinner. I've broken your law. And I ask for your forgiveness. Today I want to turn from sin. I want to turn my life completely to Jesus Christ. I believe what he did on the cross paid for my sin. I believe he was raised from the dead. Come into my life, Jesus. Take away my sin. I want you to be the, the master of my life. Today I confess, Jesus Christ is my Savior and my Lord. Father in heaven, erase my name from the book of death. Write my name in your book of life in heaven. I will follow Jesus Christ with all my heart for the rest of my life. Thank you for the gift of salvation and eternal life. In the name of the risen Savior, Jesus, I pray. Amen.